Halifax, Bradford and Keithley. We are the pulse of West Yorkshire. One o'clock, Gareth is the In 2009 and 2010, the streets of Bradford in Yorkshire became part of a crime so horrific it sent shockwaves throughout the world. Well, I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. He was weedy and needy. He was the ultimate banality of evil. A crazed killer, fueled by the need for notoriety and fame. We sat feet away from him, and he gave out his name as a crossbow cannibal. This is somebody who was almost like a wannabe serial killer. He wanted his 15 minutes in the spotlight. Three women vanished without a trace. Their dreadful fate was to unravel in the most extraordinary way imaginable. The means by which he would kill his victims uh, was chilling enough, but he may also have eaten parts of his victims' bodies. A member of the public had reported seeing body parts. My daughter's piece is still missing. What I've got on my daughter, I can't bury my daughter. A murderer so sadistic, he'd sickened the very fabric of society, making this a crime that shook Britain. Homefield Court, Bradford, West Yorkshire. The caretaker on duty is routinely reviewing the CCTV within the building when he makes a shocking discovery. But the roots of this terror started many months before. Susan Rushworth was 43 years old and had been selling her body on the streets for three years. We found out it's because people saw her on the, in the red light area. It's on the main bus route through Bradford. She was just seen, stood, waiting to be picked up. That was sad. That's not what we could do to help. As much as she'd stop and ask her to stop it, she couldn't do it. She was so dependent on the drugs. And the only way she could get the money. Heroin was ruling Susan's existence. Before her drug addiction, life was very different. Me and Susan were close growing up because there was such a short age gap between us, around 18 months between me and Susan. We had a pleasant upbringing. We lived in a country location. She got married in her early 20s and she had a family and she was really happy. She had a good life with her husband and the children. But despite the family existence, a change in fate in her 30s led Susan down a very different path. I was quite heartbroken, but she kept in touch with her ex-husband. She soon found a new boyfriend, and she seemed to be on really well. She had another child to this boyfriend. And that relationship broke down. I think that's when trouble started with the drugs. At 35, Susan was a single mother to three children and introduced into a lifestyle that was to spiral out of control. The family that knew nothing about heroin or cocaine or anything or where you'd even get it from. Come as a surprise to us all, really. I just never understood why. But then we did find out she'd been introduced by a, a boyfriend at the time. to go on that street until she earned enough money to buy a drug she needed. Then she'd take the drugs and sleep it off and that would be the day through. You look at Susan, you look so ill. Come to a point where my mum got desperate, she paid for Susan in her rehab. It seemed to work at first and she kept off the drugs and then within three months she were back on the drugs even. I think the habit even got harder and stronger. In desperation, Susan worked the red light district of Bradford, selling her body to pay for her addiction to heroin. The city's area for prostitution lies on the outskirts in an area called Manningham, 
a soulless part of town where men seek sexual gratification. I think she tried to hide the fact that she was earning money by being a prostitute. She'd say she was waiting for a bus to go and see my mother or waiting to go somewhere on a bus because it was near the bus stop where she'd stand and wait for um, punters, I think, I call them. Um, but in her hearts, I think everybody knew what she was waiting for. This is the Pulse of West Yorkshire. Good morning, Monday, June 22nd. By the summer of 2009, Susan had developed a cycle of selling sex on the streets and battling her drug addiction for years. It was a day after Father's Day, it was a Monday, and she'd left my mum's house about 1pm to go and get a methadone from a chemist in Bradford. Susan was trying to break free from the drug addiction that was controlling her life and was taking this substitute to help. She took a mobile phone with her. She said she, she was only going for a couple of hours. Well, she never come back. Then my mum, my mum started getting a bit worried, a bit, where is she now? She started ringing a mobile phone, but no answer. Hours had passed from Susan leaving the house, and it was uncharacteristic of her not to answer her phone. And she was seen boarding the bus just after one o'clock. And that's the last time anybody saw her, really. She just kind of vanished. Susan's family nervously waited for her to make contact. But as night fell, they grew increasingly concerned. Despite her lifestyle and drug habit, she always made a point of keeping in touch with her mum. Mum, she was anxious at where she was, but she thought maybe she met up with somebody. You know, she always in touch with her mum. That's one thing she always did, keep in touch with her. But Susan never made contact. Hello, where she actually, please? Paul and his family took the decision to report her missing. As the painstaking hours without her, turned into days. It was just like a living nightmare. Weeks would go by and nothing would be said and then there'd be an appeal on the TV or the local press. I just want to appeal to anyone out there who knows or see my mum. And police had searched local beauty spots and nothing would be found. Contacting local hospitals and she went in the hospital. Not for you, mate. Not for you. Police questioned some drug dealers and a person quite close to Susan, but to no avail. Have you ever used a prostitute? No. no. Never? Never. They did search quite a wide area local to Susan, where Susan was living at the time. They even dredged Manningham Park Lake and searched woodland close by. All right, working. They did talk to other working girls in Bradford and um, missing person's posters put up around Bradford for Susan. Despite extensive searches and numerous television appeals, Susan Rushworth had vanished. And further news was to confirm that something sinister could have happened to the mother of three. Susan's mobile phone and bank cards had not been used since the day she disappeared. Oh, Susan. <gasps> Bradford, West Yorkshire, June 2009. A young mother has been reported missing after going to collect a drug prescription. It's totally out of character for her, as I've said. Uh, we are obviously very concerned about, uh, about where she is at this moment in time. A sex worker in the local red light district, Susan Rushworth often had to deal with the harder side of life, but had never vanished before. We had some hope that maybe Susan had, had were fed up with her life, so she was leading. And for a final break, she'd maybe gone off to some kind of rehab centre, maybe without telling anybody. But this would have been an unusual step for Susan. And as the days turned into weeks, then months, her family lived on a knife edge, desperate for any news. We are very worried about her, her close family. We're not coping very well. I just felt anxious all the time looking over my shoulder, kept looking the face in the crowd. In desperation, Paul took to searching the streets of Bradford for his sister. You haven't seen this woman, have you? 
even questioning the other girls where she usually worked. One of which was 31-year-old Shelley Armitage. Shelley was well known in the area. Her reasons for turning to prostitution sadly echoed Susan's. Oh, we never knew she worked on the streets. You hear things, but you, you want to accept it. Shelley had a good personal life. She, uh, she was always bubbly and that. She'd always try to help anyone. She started with the drugs, which we didn't know about at first. We just picked it up as well as things went on. And uh, that's when everything seemed to change. Shelley was just 16 years old when she became addicted to heroin. It's a drug that's telling Shelley what to do at the end of the day. When she needs that drug, she needed that drug and, and she'd do all to get that drug. There's not many girls out there that do it for just the money, it's the addiction, not the, you know, they don't want to do what they're doing. It's the fact that they need to do it to make their money to get the drug. Despite a good upbringing, Shelley's life was blighted as the Class A drug took hold. The addiction became so powerful that she turned to selling her body on the streets in order to feed her habit. You do hear rumours and you hear talk of it, and I think the main thing is you don't ever want to believe that it's true. Shelley was desperate to shield her family from the harsh realities of prostitution. Dealing with regulars and complete strangers and risking her safety each night. You're listening to the Pulse of West Yorkshire. It's one o'clock on Monday the 26th of April. We've got the very latest West Yorkshire news and weather. I went in town with Jill and she, she'd come round the corner. Almost a year had now passed since Susan Rushworth had been reported missing. In the spring of 2010, Shelley Armitage was in town. Come over to talk to us and say, saying to us that uh, she was okay, you know what I mean? Shelley and her parents stood talking before heading their separate ways. Little did they know their world would change from that moment on. We went his own way, obviously Shelley went her way. And that was it. She rung Gemma up. I spoke to her twice that day, actually. It was about three o'clock. She told me that she'd ring me back. I think she'd just seen somebody. She seemed just fine, and we were just chatting about normal things, and I asked her where she was, and she said she was in town with a friend. It was just such a normal conversation. Nothing crossed my mind. I just thought that she'd ring me back. And she'd not rung me back by, I think it was about seven o'clock, so I tried to ring her back and she never answered. Shelley never called her sister again. And when she failed to return home, her boyfriend decided to raise the alarm. Craig had rung the police and at first, I don't think there were a, a real issue straight away until obviously a, a day passed or whatever and nobody had seen her. And when she didn't go for a supplement payment, we knew there was something wrong. When we knew that she'd not collected her benefits and she wasn't collecting a methadone, as each day went on, it was just things were getting more intense. Like our family, we spent day and night on the streets looking for her. I'd go up as much as I could. Literally took over my life. I was off work and just tried to do everything we could, just asking for answers, and I think we got fed up of me because I was like there so much, asking the same question, but there was just no answers. Shelley Armitage and Susan Rushworth were now missing. Both working the same area, but with no connections, and there had been no sightings reported of either of the girls. The police began their inquiries for Shelley, but despite being a popular girl, no one had seen her since the 26th of April. Well, everything runs through your mind. You don't know what's happened, do you? You, know, you think of all sorts, as you've been kidnapped. Or... There's all sorts you think of. Two weeks on from her disappearance, West Yorkshire police release footage of what they believe could be the last images caught of Shelley. Would this footage of her walking along Sunbridge Road in Bradford jog anyone's memory? and help officers to find Shelley safe and well.
West Yorkshire Police are investigating the disappearance of two young women in the area. Susan Rushworth has been missing for almost 12 months, and Shelley Armitage has recently vanished after a trip into the local town. Officers are hoping that inquiries and CCTV footage of Shelley could shed some light onto a stalling investigation. The police were good, they did everything they could. We knew the searches and, and everything that were going on. We went down for searches. What's going on? Went looking ourselves, you know what I mean, asking people. Despite the CCTV footage and extensive searches, no firm leads brought any news on Shelley's whereabouts. I'd seen it on the news that Susan Rush was missing. But Suzanne, she'd also told me that Shelley was missing. She kept saying, they haven't found Shelley, Mum. Suzanne Blaymeyers was another sex worker in the same area as Shelley Armitage and Susan Rushworth. She was 36 years old. I even spoke to Susan when Shelley was missing. With the red light district covering a small area in Bradford, news of now Shelley's disappearance spread to the other girls as family members searched for any news. It's no deterrent, is it? You know, it didn't stop the other girls going down there. She used to say it's like being on a merry-go-round. I get up and I go out to earn the money to buy me drugs. Suzanne resorted to selling her body to pay for her drug addiction. A story not dissimilar to that of Susan and Shelley's. Suzanne will have been 21 or 2 when she started on the heroin. She always used to be really bubbly, full of herself, so full of confidence. Everybody liked Suzanne. She had loads of friends. She was really happy. She was always the centre of attention. A lot of them used to go raving and they used to dance all night. At first it was just recreational drugs. But when we found out she was taking heroin, we were devastated, absolutely devastated. But we didn't really know what to do because they want the information there is now. Me and my husband didn't know anybody who took drugs. They just hit the estates at that time. They were like an epidemic. Tried everything. Where do you think you're going? You're going nowhere. At one stage, your dad locked her in the house. He thought if he locked her in, she'd get better. You're staying in tonight. Dad, please, I need to get out. Eventually, I said, what are you doing? Where are you getting all this money? Because she had loads of money. So, come on, talk to me. Working. Working where? She said, you know, I've been working down in red light area. And I were absolutely crucified by it. Despite Nikki's best efforts, Suzanne was pulled deeper into the devastating world of drugs. And just a few years on, her life had changed beyond recognition. By 25, she had turned to prostitution, just like Susan and Shelley, to get enough money for the heroin that now ruled her existence. As the hunt for Shelley and Susan continues in vain, Suzanne begins her day as normal. She stayed the night, she wants a while. And on the Friday morning, I dropped her off home because I was working. So I dropped her off early in the morning. And she said, I'll see you later, Mum. I'll uh, ring you tonight. Susan, be careful. I'll call you later. Nikki continued on to work, expecting to hear from her daughter later that evening. She didn't ring that night. But I wasn't worried, because Susan started going out later than everybody else. But the following day, a knock at the door was to change everything. And on the Saturday, about four o'clock, a boyfriend knocked at the door. Okay. Hey, you seen Suzanne? I said, well, what do you mean? No, she's yours, isn't she? No, she's not, no. She's at a flat. He said, no, she's not at a flat. I've been to the flat. Please, we better get down police station quick now. Oh, oh OK, go on. All right. Go on, OK, all right. And I knew instantly there was something wrong. 
Three women, all of whom worked in the same area, had now disappeared. The police launched their third missing person inquiry and started the hunt for Suzanne. I we went searched a flat and were asking about if anybody had seen her. It's just surreal. When they come and tell you, you know, they were out looking, searching, trying to find what had happened. And I called my family and said, you know, Suzanne's missing. Suzanne Blamires is now the third prostitute to have been reported missing in Bradford in the last 12 months. Just as police mount their search for her and begin inquiries, they receive evidence that would disturb even the most hardened detectives. Homefield Court is a block of flats in a converted mill at the heart of the red light district in Bradford. Three days after Suzanne's disappearance, the caretaker was routinely reviewing the CCTV footage when he was to make a sickening discovery. The caretaker contacted the police because of you know, what he'd seen, which was so extraordinary. He was just reviewing the CCTV footage of the weekend and you know, came across this horrific thing. The chilling footage was hard to comprehend. It shows Suzanne following a man along a corridor and into his flat. Moments later, she attempts to flee. I was sat on the couch, my sisters were there, and the police said to me, we believe she's come to serious harm. They explained the caretaker had gone into work and reviewing the footage and come across it and rung the police. And every moment were captured on CCTV. He told me that, you know, he'd chased her from the flat. And I just said, she's dead, isn't she? Uh, and he just kept saying, no, we believe she's come to serious harm, Nicky. He said, we know she's gone in this flat and she hasn't come out. In an act of pure barbarity, the man is seen following Suzanne, armed with a loaded crossbow. Actual footage showing her daughter being harmed was hard enough for Nicky to comprehend, but the horror didn't end there. Like the police said, she went in there seconds. She'd straight away realise there was something really wrong with him. Or oh, she'd seen something. The police actually told me that he, when he first fired the cross bolt at her, he missed. Two bolts had been fired at Suzanne. The second hit her head at close range. After dragging her along the corridor, he then returns and gestures to the camera. As Nikki attempted to take in the incomprehensible news about the gruesome attack on her daughter, police swooped on Homefield Court to arrest the suspect. A 40-year-old local man by the name of Stephen Griffiths. And tellingly for a monster who had acted in such a brazen manner, he gave officers what they were looking for. Here we have access to chilling footage from Stephen Griffiths' police interview. Why did you feel the need to kill her? Just, sometimes you kill someone to kill yourself. Oh, kill her. I said, I don't know, I don't know. It's like deep issues inside me. This cryptic confession was further proof that Griffiths had murdered Suzanne, possibly with the second bolt to her head. But despite this admission on the killer's part, detectives had not located a body in his flat. When Griffiths was arrested, there was an element of him looking depressed. He'd, ultimately, he had been caught. He had initially wanted to um, seemingly be uh, willing to engage with the police investigation. As detectives pressed Griffiths for more information, teams of officers scoured the area for any clues on Suzanne's whereabouts. And the news of the horrific murder was beginning to break across the country. Who was this man who had openly tortured a young woman, knowing that security cameras were present? Seemed to be somebody that looked a little bit depressed, um, quite quiet, didn't really interact with a lot of people. Rachel Farrington lived in Homefield Court near Griffiths for some years, 
and struck up a friendship with him over a mutual interest in animals. When you went into his flat, it were, it were a bit like going in a maze, really. In tanks, he kept big monitor lizards. Um, he did used to leave them to wander around on floor as well sometimes. It's a bit dismal and a bit grey, so it seemed a bit shabby. And then he picked a rat out of the box and he went, watch this, it's brilliant. And I went to the glass cage to watch and I saw this rat and it was started shaking. And this big lizard came and it actually bit it in half. I felt a little bit sick, um, but he went, look at that, that's nature for you. Billy Parkin had known Stephen Griffiths for nearly a decade and recalled some of his incredibly bizarre behaviour. I was at his flat and um, these little tiny baby rats, we just picked one out and ate it and just swallowed it down with a glass of water. Billy's recollection of his one-time friend echoed chilling stories of animal torture experienced by Griffiths's neighbour. He appeared to boast about his tendencies, hinting that his fixation with death went much further. I didn't have much empathy for human beings. It also mentioned about it had been a, he could have eaten somebody if he'd, if he'd wanted to. He obviously fantasised about cannibalism. Go get a bit. He didn't know many other people. As time went on, it seemed to be ever diminishing his circle of friends. At the time, friends may have believed Griffiths' morbid fascination with death was down to another element in his life. He was a degree student, you know, he'd got a first degree, a BA in psychology. Griffiths also was studying for a PhD, comparing modern day murder techniques with techniques from, I think it's the 19th century. It was sort of historic, a historic comparative study of murder techniques. There may be an element although this is difficult to prove, that he, in a sense, was educating himself better about the phenomenon that he was going to engage in practically. In other words, was he studying some of these books to understand how to avoid capture, how to dispose of bodies, uh, how, how police would conduct an investigation? Griffiths' obsession with the criminal mind had led him to study the area for many years. But this fascination with murder had ultimately crept into reality. And now he was toying with officers, revealing very little. Police only had the CCTV of Suzanne and other footage of Griffiths carrying items out of his flat, so any other leads were vital. As detectives pressed the killer for more information, forensic teams searched his home. But it was to be another discovery that was to elevate the horror of this investigation to another level. He said we found a so founder in the river He said to me, I've got to tell you, Nick, He's dismembered her. A member of the public had reported seeing body parts. Four days following Suzanne's disappearance, a gruesome discovery was made on the banks of a local river. And I was just so shocked, so horrified. Like I say, I knew she were dead. I never dreamt in a million years somebody had done that to her. And they found Suzanne's head in the rucksack. The crossbow bolt and the knife were still embedded in her head. And uh, it turned her skin off. Police officers in Bradford, West Yorkshire, have just made a gruesome discovery. A young woman's death has been captured on CCTV. 
With the suspect under arrest, he admits to the killing, but refuses to reveal the whereabouts of Suzanne's body. Yet evidence discovered in a local river reveals more about the crime. The news desk have picked up on these body parts that were found in the river air. When you start to think of things like the Yorkshire Ripper, is it another serial killer who's a copycat of the Yorkshire Ripper? It's that geographical location, it's that sort of area, and it's such a powerful part of history, isn't it, really? The killing did echo crimes committed by the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, a notorious madman who brutally murdered 13 sex workers during the 1970s and 80s. Suzanne's body had been mutilated and parts of her left in the river. As forensic officers continued their search of the surrounding area, the footage of Suzanne's final moments found its way to the media and went global. It really, really upset me when it appeared in the national press, you know, how horrified, how devastated. To have CCTV of somebody killing somebody, murdering somebody, I mean, most killers would probably avoid CCTV cameras rather than, you know, play up to them, which is what he did. As the country watched in horror, further remains were found in the river and police made another breakthrough with Griffiths. Are you saying that you've killed Susan Rushworth? Yes. And what was the other name? Shelley Armitage. Are you saying that you've murdered Shelley Armitage? Yes. Police come to tell us, you know, that they'd arrested a, a man and he confessed to murdering Susan. Yeah, it's just, it's just uh, talking about that, it's sorry. There was still that little bit of hope that this could be just a real sort of lunatic that we're dealing with and that he could just be making this up. But any hope Gemma and her family had was soon to be shattered. DNA tests made on some of the other remains discovered in the river air confirmed to be those of Shelley Armitage. A few days later they found Shelley. Found her about Shelley. I'm very, very sorry to have to inform you about this. I just felt numb really. I just wanted to get out of the house. I wanted to know why and how and what were her last words. But despite some clues and Griffiths' initial cooperation, when pressed for more information, the killer gave little away. And what sort of location have you put them in? If you can't tell us where, what sort of location have you put them? I don't know. Where a robot, where a computer would put them. You know, a rational, emotionless aberration would. So why did you feel the need to kill any of the girls? Mm -hmm. Fun? I don't know. Fun? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Well, I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. This disregard for life and failure to fit into society had developed at an early age. Stephen Griffiths was well known to the criminal justice system. He first got into serious trouble at the age of 17 when he attacked a supermarket manager with a knife who had stopped Griffiths from attempting to shoplift. Throughout his life, and two particular times when Griffiths was 17 and when he was 22, he was assessed as having a personality disorder and that, and in particular, that he had violent fantasies and fantasized about murdering. Elements of Griffiths' past showed him to have homicidal tendencies. A man on the edge of society who had previously received psychiatric treatment Griffiths also appeared to create an alter ego online and play out many of his dark thoughts for all to see. 
He would sign himself on some of his Facebook pages and at times in Amazon as Ven Pariah. We might look at the Ven as being a shortening of Stephen or indeed Venerable and Pariah obviously an outcast, somebody who was um, uh, not quite accommodated within the kind of culture that he was trying to make his way within. His alter ego as Van Pariah and information that would not have been public and not have been there for public consumption was coming out very rapidly. This is a man who's so narcissistic that any attention that he can get by changing his name or by playing with his name, by the kinds of clothes that he wore, the kinds of books that he was reading, he's trying to gain your attention because by gaining your attention, he has power over you. Details were coming out through Amazon about what he'd purchased. So, you know, he'd bought crossbow bolts and his, you know, the books he'd bought, the books he'd looked at, that all that information was coming out. I guess it just reflects the change in technology. If you purchase stuff from Amazon, for example, or if you've got a profile on Facebook, for example, then it's there for all to see. I think he may have consciously been playing with his name. He certainly was consciously playing with his image. There were images of him on Facebook where he has his hair pulled back, where his hair was quite clearly neatly tied and oiled and greased. He perhaps was even wearing makeup. He doesn't care about the judgment that you make on him because the judgment is irrelevant. It's the fact that you're prepared to give him the time of day. He admits at the time that he may have committed further murders, although crucially, we haven't found the body of one of his victims and therefore that does imply that the kind of information he was giving to the police was very constrained indeed. And so I think is untrue, but it was a way of drawing attention to himself. It was a way of feeding his ego. Despite body parts belonging to Suzanne and Shelley being found, police could not gain any information on the whereabouts of Susan's body from Griffiths. Stephen Griffiths was driven to Bradford Magistrates Court this morning to face three murder charges. The alleged killing of three women in Bradford over the past... The killer's desperation for attention played out in the most sickening way when Griffiths first appeared in court. The magistrate asked his name and he, that's what he called himself. My name is the Crossbow Cannibal. He was very much a wannabe. He was part of our celebrity culture. He saw himself as part of that celebrity culture and in fact was trying to manipulate that culture by, for example, at his first court appearance, saying that his name was the Crossbow Cannibal. Well, those two words, crossbow, the means by which he would kill his victims, uh, was chilling enough. But the idea that he may also have eaten parts of his victims' bodies adds to the kind of horror of how he was identifying himself. It was a terrible shocking thing. You can't be human for a man to say he's eating other people's flesh. You're just not a human being. Six months on from the disappearance of Shelley and Suzanne, and more than 18 months after the last sighting of Susan, Stephen Griffiths stood trial at Leeds Crown Court. The families of the women were to endure further torment as more graphic details of his sadistic crimes unfolded. I can remember distinctly in court that they said it was 81 body parts, 81 separate parts of Suzanne Blamire's. Susan Rushworth's not been found. I don't know if linked him to Susan's murder by DNA from blood samples and splatterings across his bathroom wall and in his bathroom underneath his bath and his bedroom. And they were quite disturbing to find blood on his boots a year, a year later virtually. My heart were hammering just at seeing him. He just showed contempt for all the proceedings basically details that came out in court were absolutely horrific. The police tell you what concerns your daughter, but they don't tell you what concerns the others. So some of the details obviously we hadn't heard. I felt physically sick when they said that they'd got DNA off the cooker. 
belonging to the other girls and, you know, it basically cooked them. Further horrid details were to emerge, showing the crazed killer bounding his victims and taking images of their lifeless bodies. Most of the serial killers that I've worked with and most of the writing about uh, literature about serial killers will talk about uh, taking trophies. In Griffiths' case, the trophies were photographs. It's a way of very deliberately putting himself back in the moment when he was about to take uh, his victim's life. It was a way of reminding himself of that moment when he was all-powerful, when he was able to exercise the power of life and death over the women that he was going to kill. You can't describe what, what it's like, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm seeing him sat there, you know. I mean, you just want to get to him, but you can't, you know what I mean? Following a highly charged trial, Stephen Griffiths was given three life sentences after pleading guilty to murdering Susan, Shelley, and Suzanne. The judge said he would never be released. Since his detainment, the evil killer has continued to try and exert his control. He has attempted suicide and gone on hunger strike on a number of occasions. This is frankly fairly typical behavior. It doesn't mean to imply that he's showing remorse, that he wants to take his own life, um, even though he's self-harming. This is a way, again, I think, of feeding his underlying narcissism. This is drawing attention to him, keeping his name known to the media. If you cannot control any other aspect of your life, but harming yourself with a razor blade or a sharp instrument, it is nonetheless a form of control. Stephen Griffiths will face the rest of his life in prison. But the true sentence has been handed down to the families of his victims. It's not a closure, it's... It'll never be a closure to me till... He's told me what he's done. Maybe, maybe I'm not going to find out, shall I? But at least tell me what you've done. I think we'll always go here for answers. I think we need answers. We're trying as best to move on, but I don't think we can ever until we found out where Susan is. Shelley was a good kid. It was a drug that made her do what she did. But she was well respected, well known, smartly dressed. And she didn't deserve what happened to her. I just like to think of all the good and happy memories of her and he's just doesn't sort of fears me now. I don't, don't want to think about him. My wife doesn't seem the same without her. Yeah, you know, she was my sister. She wasn't just my sister, she was my friend. People say, oh, it gets easier with time. Um, I'm not quite convinced I believe that. I know what my daughter did. I know what she was. And I'm not ashamed because I know what made her like she was. I'd like Suzanne to be remembered how she was before the drugs took hold of her. Happy, full of confidence, cheeky. Just a star, really. I miss her every day of my life. There's never a day goes by when I don't think about what. I don't think I'll feel like that while I die, probably. <laughs> <laughs>